Welcome everybody to today's uh, professional activities event. We have a, we're pleased to have here the Lieutenant Governor of Guam, Mr. Roy, Ray Tenorio, and Mr. Nathan DeKnight, the President of the Guam Visitors Bureau. I don't have to tell anybody in this room that Guam's been in the news a lot lately, but since uh, Kim Jong Un threatened to fire intermediate range of ballistic missiles near <coughs> Guam waters, raises a lot of questions like, uh, uh, suppose they overshoot by a few kilometers, or we know that there is a anti-missile system there, will they activate it or will they uh, fear whether they sh not to do that. There's the Japanese angle with the tourism. I think Guam is, I may be corrected if I'm wrong, but I think the second most destination for Japanese honeymooners than, than Hawaii. There's also the issue of uh, Marines. The, <coughs> under the agreement with Japan to lighten the load on Okinawa, something like, uh, I think 8,000 Marines are to be transferred to uh, uh, Guam, <clears throat> we've had a lot of speakers from Okinawa at this place, but this is the first time we have a chance to see, see hear from those who are on the receiving end of this. Mm -hmm. So without any further ado, I, I give you our speakers, Mr. Tenorio. Hafari, good morning, everyone. I want to thirst, uh, thank you all, the Foreign Correspondents uh, Club here in Japan in Tokyo for giving us the opportunity to be here. Thank you for making the time available for us. I also, before I go into my comments, I, I want to particularly uh, thank um, the people of Japan and the uh, Guam Visitor Bureau and the staff and ADK uh, who has been uh, staffing us and making sure we set up all these different meetings and um, uh, Sensei who is also here today, uh, one of my good friends that we met here, uh, who has been a, a good friend to the island of Guam. Um, since I've been here, we've met with a great number of uh, individuals, including correspondents, uh, many officials from the Japanese government, including including the Vice Minister Hiroshi Tabata of the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Transportation and Tourism, the Director General for Commerce and Service Industry Policy, Mr. Toshimitsu Fujiki, from the Minister of Economy, Trade, Industry, and others. Um, we met, of course, with many fine uh, folks as yourself uh, who have been very receptive to our message. Um, do I need to stop to allow for translation or just uh, continue? We don't have a translation. Okay, so no translation, I hope. <laughs> After this issue. I will try to be as deliberate as possible. Um, you know, when I left Guam a couple of days ago, it was an absolutely beautiful day. Um, and it, that's the way it is most of the time. Uh, many, many thousands I, of tourists uh, from various places, in the, especially Japan, is our number one market, uh, enjoy uh, our beautiful waters and, of course, our shopping like you would find in any resort destination. But the culture and the experiences that are different in Guam is, I think, what continues to bring people back uh, all the time to our wonderful island. Um, I have to admit, sometimes it's really hard to do my job in my office because I oversee a, a picturesque spot in Adloop Point. And if you look outside of my office where I'm sitting at my desk, many times you'll see the uh, dolphins uh, chasing the fish uh, literally uh, outside of the reef and so you know I live <laughs> I live in a place as a resort destination uh, and I see these things every single day including the whales and uh, the beauty that is our island and I, I invite every one of you to come and every one of your families um, uh, sometimes uh, it, it's very difficult to uh, focus on the business and the government for that reasons but I know the the pressing issue here for a lot of people is the um, the issues of North North Korea and, and the island. Um, I can tell you with absolute certainty, uh, we have confidence in our military. Uh, we are one of the most protected and safe islands uh, you will find uh, in, in the world. Um, we know that the layers of defense uh, that protect our community uh, and all of our tourists uh, is uh, resolute. Uh, when when the military uh, armies or, or general, navy, uh, any of the Marine Corps, when they say that they are mission capable to defend the island, the credibility uh, is absolute. We know that they're able to defend, um, and so we have confidence in them. Also, in the, in the island, we have one of the highest rates of um, 
participation or volunteerism uh, in the military per capita across the entire United States. Uh, myself included, um, uh, all of my children, my five children, um, let's see, um, my oldest is uh, a former army uh, officer or, or in the Ar army, uh, she was a soldier. Uh, my second is married to an Air Force, uh, um, uh, he's a member of the Air Force. Uh, my third, which is uh, Ray Jr., is in uh, Air Force in uh, California. Uh, my fourth child is a uh, member of the Guam Army National Guard. And uh, my fifth and youngest child uh, just had his own child, and they're in South Korea at Camp Humphrey, right outside, you know, the DMZ. Uh, and he's with his wife and my youngest grandchild who's just over one years old. So there's a great investment uh, on behalf of all the people of Guam in the military because we love our country like you do as well. And we know that uh, when they say they can do something, they can get it done. The uh, local government has a great working relationship with the Navy and the Air Force uh, and of course uh, the Marines, the Coast Guard, uh, and we always are in communication with the Joint Region Marianas, which is uh, Admiral Chatfield and uh, as well as the Air Force uh, General who's uh, working with us on a regular basis. And we have high confidence in the national security, not only of Guam, but uh, our allies in the region and our communication for Homeland Security, Civil Defense, and making sure the emergency systems are well uh, in place is something we do on a regular basis. Just like right now, the South Korea, uh, our ally with South Korea is practicing with the uh, military, uh, and there's a good number of thousands of military members who are practicing. We do that with Japan, with Australia, with the Philippines, and other countries in the, in the Pacific region uh, quite a bit. And that's what makes us confidence in the preparedness of our island, not only to be able to combat uh, um, any possible uh, attacks on Guam, but also prepare us, for the most part, uh, in cases of storms, which we're most familiar with. Um, for the most part, by and large, 99% of our population just go about their lives every single day. We just started school last week. Kids um, went to school, their mothers uh, got them on the bus. Uh, fathers and mothers go to work every single day uh, like we do. The tourists keep coming off the plane and we and get them to the hotels and get them to the water and, and do the things that they love to do in Guam. So things are normal on Guam. And I tell you personally, uh, I never believed that uh, there would be any uh, firing of any missiles to Guam um, because I, I think very clearly if you look back um, Kim Jong-un has said he wanted his leaders and the military leaders to look at the prospect of firing four missiles and I think it was the specificity the details that he had indicated now as opposed to the past because he's been threatening Guam since 2013 um, that's when we implemented the THAAD system, which is in place, as well as the Aegis and the Patriot missile system, which all defend us. So since 2013, it's been five years now that we have been under the protection of these multiple layers of defense. And um, these are the reasons that we have confidence in, in our ability to not just uh, combat any possible attacks, but we don't believe one will occur in the first place. Uh, one final thing uh, on the tourist note uh, is, uh, you know, we're, Guam is proud of many things, our beauty, our culture, uh, our sense of anaphomalic to make things better. And um, we're particularly proud uh, recently in our efforts in uh, our 5Ks, our 10Ks, our athletic uh, acumen. You know, we come here and we participate in, in, the, in the different uh, half marathons and marathons in Guam, uh, I'm sorry, in Japan. And we have a lot of your uh, residents who come to uh, Guam. And this October, uh, we have the Guam Visitors the Bureau Coco Half Marathon Race uh, and has grown from a small of event uh, for a couple hundred people to what we're expecting to be a couple thousand this time. So um, I want to invite you and your families and make sure that you understand uh, whether it's you yourself or your children or your, uh, your newlywed, uh, coming to Guam is, is an absolute safe place to come and we are protected and you're absolutely welcome uh, and we thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak uh, to you today and I hope you'll be able to convey this message to the rest of the Japanese people. Thank you very much. Mr. McKnight? Indian Knight, excuse me.
Mr. D Knight. McKnight. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, McKnight sounds good though too. Uh, half a day is how we say uh, hello in Guam or Konnichiwa. So half a day to everyone here today. I want to thank the uh, FCCJ for hosting us uh, today on such short notice. Really appreciate all your help and support. And on behalf of the Vis Guam's Visitors Bureau and the people of Guam, we want to thank you for joining us today. Um, you know, Japan is so important to Guam and has been our number one a visitor source market. In fact, this year we are celebrating 50 years since the first flight from <coughs> Japan to arrived on Guam with uh, travel agents and visitors and Japanese media. I mean, we still do the same activity today, bringing Japanese travel agents and media uh, to experience our destination and get the word out to uh, the rest of the Japanese people. Um, there's been much attention on our island since the North Korea issue occurred. But visitors are still coming. Um, I looked at the numbers on October 15th. Uh, we welcomed 2,195 Japanese visitors to Guam. And we're here today to reassure the Japanese people that Guam is safe and peaceful. You know, there has been no increase in our threat level throughout this entire issue. And it's uh, business as usual, or as the LT said the other day, fun as usual. And, you know, we welcome our Japanese visitors to continue with their plans uh, to come and enjoy. Guam's beautiful beaches, nature, attraction, shopping, optional tours, everything that makes Guam a perfect destination. Um, people have been asking me a lot about our tourism arrival numbers and any effects. So August is typically our busiest month of the year. And in fact, last August was the best month in Guam's tourism uh, industry history as far as arrivals. We welcomed uh, 144 1,758 arrivals last year. I, I took a look at the numbers. The latest numbers we have are as of August 15th, and the visitor arrivals uh, for the month of August were up 3% versus last year. Uh, so what this is telling me is uh, in the short term, there has been no effect uh, from this North Korean incident. However, everyone here understands that tourism is a fragile industry, and Guam's brand image was built as a very safe, family-friendly destination. So that's why we want to reassure the people of Japan that there has been no change and Guam is safe for travel. And so although the global spotlight has been on Guam in these uh, recent days, uh, Guam you know, remains safe and protected. I gotta say, uh, you know, we've had so much global media on Guam. Uh, we did a, uh, a couple of press conferences last <coughs> week and there was over 100 media, media from you know, the Middle East, Canada, Israel, um, the, uh, Japan, Japan's, the, you know, throughout Asia, CNN, BBC, all the major medias were on Guam. Uh, but, you know, most of, after talking with most of the media, you know, they were really impressed with our island destination, how beautiful it was, all the things there were to do, and most of all, the beautiful, friendly people that were so hospitable. You know, in fact, we hosted uh, the media at a big media event uh, at our Two Lovers Point, our most famous <coughs> scenic site. Uh, you know, and they were just blown away by the sunset and, uh, you know, our great uh, food and, and uh, our Chamorro music and culture and just talking with each other in a very friendly environment. And so many of them have, uh, you know, came up to me and want to come back with their uh, friends and family or their spouses to just enjoy Guam. So that was excited, excited to see. And, you know, as, you know, um, you know, as we're managing this spotlight and this media attention from the Guam Visitors Bureau perspective and the thank you to the um, Lieutenant Governor and the Governor, you know, we really wanted to share, uh, you know, it was a good opportunity for us to share about Guam with all this international media. So many of them did stories about us as a tourism destination. Mm. You know, in fact, even uh, President Trump <laughs> called our governor, you know, and he said with all the media attention that Guam was getting, you know, he made a joke that we would be up our tourism would grow tenfold. So as I mentioned, we're already having a record visitor arrival number, so we don't have enough rooms to go up tenfold, but we would appreciate, you know, we do appreciate the attention and, uh, you know, although we have to, it was uh, in a negative light, but it gave us an opportunity to show all the positive things about Guam. So, and, and you know, most of the visitors, uh, many of the media talk to the visitors. I talked to many visitors in Guam, uh, Japanese visitors, and kind of the general sentiment was that, um, you know, whether they traveled to Guam or they stayed in Japan, their level and comfort uh, and their peace of mind would, be, would, would have been the same. There was really no effect. And so uh, we want to reinforce that message and then we want to encourage, you know, all our potential visitors to, uh, you know, continue with their plans to travel to Guam. You know, let them know that they're... 
there has been no change in the threat level and that Guam remains the same mm -hmm. safe, peaceful, family-friendly destination. So once again, thank you all for making the time to be here today. Uh, to do smasi and domo arigato gozaimashita. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to add one thing. You know, We met with um, a lot of media representatives like yours, yourself here. And, uh, and last night, uh, we met with um, a resident manager of a very uh, distinguished uh, resident, long-term resident uh, uh, company. And prior to that, we had a dinner with a, a member of the, uh, the television news, uh, and she's a reporter. And um, Starting with the previous, the lady said, you know, we, we've been hearing, and I get a lot of people, you know, of course, uh, when someone raises the, uh, you know, red flag or sends a flare up in the air, everybody pays attention. But um, she, she said basically that, you know, she's been living on Guam a long time before. She's now living back here in Tokyo. And she said she, she never had any concerns. And this same message was uh, echoed previously in our dinner with the television reporter. And she said she came to Guam for the same uh, event and she was talking to all the people that were coming out of the store and she interviewed a whole bunch of them uh, just person after person after person and every one of them said the same thing when she was a asking them what are your thoughts about North Korea they're not worried about it, it truthfully and and I want that peace of mind to be something that everyone walks away with here is that we don't say these things just because we want to assure you we, we say these things because we absolutely believe them um, if you have confidence in someone that you're close to if you have confidence in in your family if you have confidence in your boss and your boss tells you something you believe that and so you 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 take stock in those words the peace of mind that I have that the people People of Guam, as I, I oversee public safety in Guam, I have absolute peace of mind. I know that our military, I know that our tourists, I know that our residents will all be safe. And so I want that to be the re resonant message here for you all today. It's not just me saying words. This is a feeling, an understanding, and a belief that we, are not just we, but all of you and all the tourists that come to Guam will be safe and have the peace of mind and confidence in the words that we give you. Questions now, please. Uh, we will open it now for <coughs> questions. Anybody? Ah, Anthony. Okay. Um, Anthony Rowley, Singapore Business Times. Sorry, I came in rather late, but um, you say there's no change in the threat level. Well, of course, there has been a change in the threat level in the sense that North Korea has said it might target Guam, so that is a change. So is your assurance given on the basis of, of concrete evidence that the protection of Guam, if you like, has been stepped up um, sufficiently for you to make offer that guarantee that there's no change in the threat level. And secondly, I'm sorry if you've already covered this point, but what impact has there already been in recent weeks on tourist arrivals in Guam? Hmm. So the, the, your, your first question about what more has been done to protect the island since um, Kim Jong-un made the original request to his leaders um, was, first of all, was not a definitive threat. <clears throat> he essentially said, go leaders, take a look at this plan. The plan is to shoot four missiles. Um, that's what he had indicated. Uh, the threat was uh, something uh, more along the lines of look at the possibility of doing this. And so the leaders came back to him in the middle of the month, which is, of course, the 15th. And um, at that time, after the comments from uh, President Trump and the people from the military in uh, throughout the Pacific had indicated that Guam is safe. So beyond that, there was no further support or, or any um, strengthening of the defense of the island that was necessary because all the defenses are already in place. So the, there are multiple layers of defense, and I, I, don't, um, I don't have uh, the classified access to classified information. Uh, so there's only the ones that you know and I know, uh, the Aegis system, the Patriot missiles, and the THAAD system. And there are different versions in different places. So I can tell you that nothing beyond that, to my knowledge, has been added to it. The infrastructure is sound. The technology is sound. We have confidence 
in the credibility of the military members, um, whether it be four-star generals or admirals or someone just going into the military, that when they meet their expectations to defend our island as a member of any of the armed services, that they can do that. And so I, I don't know with respect to the, uh, um, I'll ask uh, Nate uh, to, to uh, do the response in the second part. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, about As far as uh, tourism arrivals, as I said in my statement, uh, we had the numbers through August 15th through the middle of the month. And as I mentioned, last August was the, the best month in the history of Guam's uh, tourism industry as far as total visitor arrivals with over almost a, uh, over 144,000 visitor arrivals. So as of the uh, 15th, we were tracking above 3% above last year. 3% above last year, which was uh, our all-time best month ever. Um, so we'll see how the, we'll, you know, we'll release the final numbers with the breakdown between all the different markets at the end of the month. Uh, usually by the 10th of uh, the following month, we'll have those numbers on our website. But yeah, so uh, I mean, in the short term, there has been uh, no effect from this threat. But, you know, as I mentioned in my statement, uh, tourism is a very fragile industry and people, uh, because of, you know, the media spotlight on the island, uh, you know, may, may be, uh, you know, in the medium to long term can have a chance to uh, adjust their travel plans. And that's why we're here today with uh, Lieutenant Governor Tenorio to really assure the Japanese people of the facts. And, you know, there has been, on Guam, we did not raise the threat level. I mean, that's not saying that you know, maybe North Korea has made threats or elevated, but those are, that's from them. But from our government officials, which is the Office of the Governor, together with the U.S. military, and in including our, as high as the president who called their governor last Saturday, there has been no increase in the threat level. So I think, you know, uh, you, know talk, you know, I think we need to keep the facts, you know, on, see, see the facts and understand the facts and, and, op and, and operate uh, with the facts, yeah. So thank you. Next question, please. Am I missing anybody? It's hard to see <laughs> against the television lights sometimes. Mm. Yeah. Here we mm. go. <coughs> I'm Sawaki Kita, uh, working for uh, Asahi Shimbun, a uh, newspaper in Japan. Um, do you think that uh, uh, Guam would be a safer place uh, if you get independent rather than being a part of the United States? Mm. <laughs> That's a good question. I think, I, I, I'll tell you my personal beliefs. Uh, I'm an American citizen. I was born an American citizen. I'm proud of my country. I know that um, in life and the history of human existence that we know, um, there has always been conflict. One person threatening another. And that the best uh, defense is to have the best knowledge and skills and abilities that our country, United States, uh, allies with Japan and other countries, as you all know. Um, and that alliance is built on the ability to support each other in the time of need. And I think that being part of America and the family that is our nation is um, one that we share information and we grow from that information, but we also share technology so that the people of Japan and the people of Guam and the people of South Korea and other allies in the Pacific enjoy the defense of the best military in, in, the, in the world. And I don't know that removing that defense or removing the being part of that family of the United States is in the best interest of the people of Guam. There's always going to be someone who wants to do something differently or wants to be independent. But I'm, I'm a believer that by joining together to stand together, we're stronger as opposed to weaker. And I think that sometimes countries and individuals will prey on or will target those who may be weak. And by removing the United States military from Guam or the defense of our island, I don't know that that strengthens us. As a matter of fact, I think it weakens us. Thank you. I have a question. Sure. Uh, you know there was a deal made <coughs> with Japan to lighten the military burden on Okinawa by shifting several thousand Marines mm -hmm. to Guam. Could you just bring us up to date on that? I, 
I, we haven't heard about it for a long time. Sure. There was just a contract that was issued um, just last week, as a matter of fact, and I can send that information to you by linkage through our GVB um, uh, Japan leadership here. Uh, but the initial stages of building that new military base are well on their way. Um, so the monies have been freed up. The plans have been laid out. Uh, it's called uh, NICTAMS, which is Naval Communications and um, um, Station in NICTAMS. That that um, that old facility is being retrofitted now, uh, and will be over the next um, several years to uh, allow for uh, military members to come from the Marines in Okinawa to Guam. I think the initial um, boots on the ground will start to grow uh, as early as uh, either late 2018 or 2019, so we'll start to see incremental movement of those troops from um, Okinawa, as best I can uh, recollect on the news story. Uh, but the, the the people of Guam, uh, again, going back to the previous question, uh, you know, uh, some people want independence, and you're, you're always going to find someone who wants something different. Uh, but I think the vast majority of the people of Guam uh, are still in support of the military buildup, and um, you, you always have dissension. And that's one thing about being in the United States is, uh, you know, in, in Japan, um, the freedom to be able to redress the government, to file your grievances, to, to be heard as a member of the society is something that um, is, a, is a great gift uh, in, in democracy. Um, and uh, some people have been asking, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll take your question as an opportunity to, to hit another point. You know, some people have been asking me, what would be my message to Kim Jong-un? Uh, the president or the leader of North Korea. And um, one of the messages uh, Nate tonight and I talked about was there's a f word, it's called Inafa Malik. It's I N A F A, Inafa Malik, M A U L E G, no? Malik? Look it up, friends. You know, I have to remember my spelling. Lo, Inafa Malik means basically to make it good. To make good. It's like um, if you have a conflict between, you know, um, a husband and wife and they're having a difficulty and you have a, like a mediator comes in to try to figure it out or if you have family squabbles. So enough of Malik is a cultural um, value on Guam. And, and so my message to Kim Jong-un is we need to use this Chamorro culture of enough of Malik to bring people together, to talk to have the same kind of dialogue, and that's what was mentioned today in the North Korea uh, our, uh, conversation on CNN, is you know we need to have dialogue and, and conversation, and talk across the table and break bread and, and get to know where, where the long-term interests of the North Korea uh, people are and the South Korean and the United States and our relationships, because by using enough amalik, by making this situation go from bad to good, then I think a lot of anxiety will be relieved. I think a lot of difficulties will be relieved on behalf of the North Korean people and the people of Japan and the people of Guam and the United States. So if we, if we take this opportunity, which is not a positive one, but we turn it into a good one, a nafamalik, using a nafamalik to talk, understand, and, and, and make a path forward, uh, I think a lot of people will be benefited from that. Okay, I'll give you the spelling. Uh, I N A. F A, and then there's a, an apostrophe, and Maulek is spelled M M A O L E K. If, if I could follow up a little on my question, you know, certain elements of the plan in Okinawa have been resisted very strongly by people in Okinawa. Mm. What is the, how do, should I put it, the political situation, or how are how are the, has there been controversy of about stationing as much as uh, 8,000 new mar Marines in Guam. After all, your Guam has a pretty big military footprint, too. Mm, that's true. Um, as I mentioned, again, going back to what I said earlier, you're always going to find someone who doesn't like something. Uh, you'll find someone who doesn't like motherhood and apple pie. You know, I mean, in the end, there's always going to be someone who doesn't like something. Um, we do have um, a portion of the population in Guam uh, that don't um, don't agree with the military, but, uh, but that's, again, the beauty of our democracy is to be able to voice our, our, our differences. Uh, and so they, I think the vast majority of the people of Guam uh, do support the military build up. Um, there has been uh, some people that uh, talked about uh, independence, uh, but there's a, 
he heavy um, appreciation for the United States federal government and what they do for the people of Guam day in, day out, year in, year out. Um, so uh, very specifically, there, there are some uh, who do not want the military to build up, but uh, there are some in Okinawa that appreciate the Marines, some people don't appreciate them. Um, and I think sometimes in the past, uh, there have been incidents that happen where the, uh, the military members, would be the Navy or Air Force or, or Marines, and one member of that branch or the other does something wrong. And that cast is a very negative image for the entire branch. Um, I'm a police officer before. You have a police officer who gets involved with drugs or gets involved with crime. And so people look at the police department through the lens of what that officer did, rather than what the lens of all the others did. So these are perception issues sometimes that cast a negative um, public relations perception on the entity, whether it be Air Force, Navy, or you know, police department. But I think one thing I, I, I know from meeting many, many of them is it's usually the younger ones who are doing the things that you know, young people do sometimes. You know, we, we, we make mistakes and we hopefully learn from them. And many years later, we look back on those mistakes and realize that was really stupid what I did. And, and then they go on with their life and they become better members of the community by and large. But most of the military members that I experience, including Marines, are upstanding, good people, and um, serve their country and serve their allies uh, very well. Another question? Okay. Just as a matter of interest, what does Guam regard as its chief competitor as an exotic uh, holiday destination? Is it uh, British Caledonia, or Tahiti? What are the alternatives to going to Guam? All of the above. <laughs> you know, Guam's, Guam's a population of 160,000 people. But the culture in Guam is, in my opinion, very unique. The Chamorro culture. But one thing about Guam is we're a melting pot. We have a substantial Filipino population who lives harmoniously with the Chamorros. As a matter of fact, their Chamorro man and a Filipino woman marry and have children and they're half Filipino, half Chamorro. But they identify with the Guam and they kind of assume this island culture, the Chamorro culture. And so to your issue about, you know, what is our competition? I don't think anybody um, exceeds Guam's hospitality. Anybody in this room that's been to Guam knows that we have a beautiful place, and so does Hawaii, uh, so does New Caledonia, so does Fiji, so does a lot of different countries in Asia. But if you're going to Guam for just the water and the sand, you can find that almost anywhere. But if you're going to Guam for an experience that is different, for looking at the culture of the Chamorros in the ancient Chamorro um, village or the ancient Chamorro hieroglyphics or the the Chamorro culture if you're going to a place cause I don't come to, to Japan to to engage in any other cultural experience I come to Japan because I love absolutely love the Japanese food the tradition the language the respect you Japan is a fantastic uh, nation I just came back from Hokkaido. My, I just got married, as a matter of fact, for your information. I just married a lady from Osaka, Madoka Hosotani. And she, she lives in Katano Shi before. She is a, a bakery chef in Leo Palace, Guam. And so we went to Osaka from June 10 to June 15. And then from 15 to the 20th, we stayed in Hokkaido. And it's absolutely beautiful. And, you know, please, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but, you know, with North Korea, for example, you know, uh, North Korea fires missiles over Japan. And I know that really upsets a lot of people for good reason. But I still came to Japan because I know that you're okay. I know that your country is, is very good. And I know your, your food is amazing, your hospitality. It's just everything about Japan is amazing. I love it. But, but I, I, I have to say, back to the question, if you're going to compete uh, with Guam, you have to raise your game because Guam is an amazing place. Great culture, unique experiences, and something that you will never find, I think, in any other place. So in that respect, we don't compete with anybody. <laughs> is that it? Go ahead.
Thank you very much for Thank coming you. to the club. Khaldun Azari, Panorite News. I have two small questions. Okay. Uh, if I assume that North Korea fired missile, what is your uh, real defense against that in terms of military technology? Mm -hmm. And second question, I, a long time ago I wanted to visit Guam, but somebody told me, no, you go to Saipan, it's nicer. <laughs> and they said there are some snakes in, in Guam. <laughs> So uh, please explain. Let me ask. The, let me answer the second question first, yes. okay? You know, I tell you, there's a great exaggeration about the people in the, the snakes on Guam, okay? Can I tell you? I live on Guam, all right? And I've been living in this one house for almost 20 years. Not one time have I seen a snake. I'm sorry. I saw a snake one time outside my house, okay? One time, and it, what happened is it, we had a carpet that was rolled up. And you know, the, the snakes, they like to get into places that are sheltered, right? So we went into a carpet. And so I opened up the carpet and I saw the snake, right? But that was the first time, one time in 20 years. So do the math. Do the math. On 365 days times almost 20 years, one time seeing a snake. The exaggeration of the snake problem on Guam is amazing, right? So let me tell you, when you take a step, you know, you go, you go walking like this, you, you, you don't have to worry about stepping on a snake, okay? That's, that's, that's the way it's described sometimes. So trust me when I tell you, it's a gross exaggeration, okay? Thank you. All right, mosquitoes uh, are a different story. No, I just joking. I promise to visit next time. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> the, um, uh, and the issue of uh, if, if, number one, I don't believe that Kim Jong-un will fire a missile at Guam, not a missile at Guam. I do not believe that. <clears throat> and I'll leave it to your own devices whether you think that is true, um, but my own personal belief is that he will not because the consequences for doing so would be so dire. It would be irreversible. Um, and President Trump has indicated as much. There will be, he will be held accountable. And that's what we do in, in civilized society. If you do something wrong, you're held accountable. So um, I don't believe that he'll do that. Um, and if you get beyond that first premise and say that if it does happen, um, I go back to my previous statement about the military. If my son, who is a fireman in the Air Force, in um, Travis Air Force Base in California, tells me that he can drag the fire hose, connect it to the fire hydrant, go to the nozzle on the other end, and put out the fire within X number of minutes, based on his expertise, I know he'll be able to do that. Because he realizes that lives are reliant on his ability to do those things. So when the generals and the admirals of any number of stars tell me, including Chatfield from Joint Region Marianas in the Navy in Guam, says, we are protected, we are safe as an island. And I mentioned the three different missile systems I'm not going to go through again. I know that the men and women in the Army and the Air Force that are manning the THAAD system and those that are on the Aegis system and those that are on the Patriot system are able to take down that missile before it hits the Guam. I sleep very well at night, no problems. I know my kids, my grandkids that live in Guam, and my, my family, my wife, all of them are, are safe. And so are all the tourists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We still have some plenty of time if there are more questions. Wave your hand. I can't see too well against the TV lights. Over here, did I hear? No. Yes, sir. My name is Kurt Sieber. I'm an associate member here. Um, according to my level of knowledge, and I'm not claiming that this is 100%, uh, I understand that um, our good friend Kim has never threatened to hit Guam. He, what he uh, said, he threatened to send some missiles into the water 30, 40 miles out of Guam just to show that he can hit uh, Guam if he wanted to. Is, uh, can you update me on that? Because I think we, there's too much talk about hitting Guam, whereas the real threat was hitting waters outside Guam. <laughs> Thank you. 
You know, I, I think you're exactly right um, about the first part of that, which you said, threatening. Um, he, and I'll re reiterate what I talked about earlier, is why I remember, and correct me if I'm wrong, went to his military leaders and asked them to look at a plan to fire four missiles within 30 to 40 kilometers from Guam. There's a difference, in my opinion, of making his military leaders go out and assess a plan versus saying, I'm going to fire four missiles within 30 to 40 kilometers of Guam. I think there's a major difference. And, and here's, <clears throat> here's the second part, I think. If I go to your house and I shoot bullets in the, um, to the left and to the right of your house, but I don't actually hit your house, have I targeted your house? Did I endanger you or your family by shooting those bullets to the left and to the right of your house? Do you have peace and tranquility at home because I'm shooting these bullets to the left and to the right of your house? I would think that the answer is no. And I think that's true for anyone in this room. If someone threatens to do something that has the potential to cause injury, death, or anything like that, I think that's enough. Uh, of an attack. Where do you draw the line? It's splitting hairs. You know, how do you, you know, how close is close enough? If those missiles are uh, shot toward Guam in a proximity that our national leaders, including President Trump or the generals or the admirals, believe is a sufficient attack on the island, that's their prerogative. I'm not going to define what that is. But I think that there's a reasonableness that anybody, per, any person has on whether or not they're actually targeted or attacked. Um, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not in geopolitical uh, conversations like this uh, very often, but I'll leave it to the military apparatus and our nation leaders to figure out whether they determine 30 to 40 kilometers is sufficient. Is 50 sufficient? Is 100 sufficient? I mean, where, where do you draw the line? If the, if the inclination of Kim Jong-un is to threaten and, as he put it, to contain the Navy and the Air Force, I don't think he's containing anything. He's, um, he's just threatening Guam. But that's in the context of going to look at, you know, and, and all the specifics is the one that raises most of the eyebrows here. If I'd like to ask a question again. Sure. Have you got some kind of civil defense program mm -hmm. in the event that they actually do fire a, a missile. And keeping in mind that uh, if they d d did this, it would be the first test of, a, of a, the accuracy of one of their missiles over 3,000 kilometers. So it's not impossible that they may miscalculate and actually hit <coughs> hmm. Guam. So do you have some uh, civil defense measures against that contingency? Well, um I can, I can tell you a number of things. Number one, yes, we do have a civil defense uh, infrastructure, just like most civilized countries do. We, we have an emergency broadcast system, I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, that exists within the U.S. that uses radio and television uh, broadcast uh, to notify people of any emergency. Also, as you know, uh, mobile devices, which we all use, and I just got a call from my chief of staff. Uh, these things, messaging is instant now. You know, when someone dies like Jerry Lee Lewis, immediately everybody in the world knows. Uh, this kind of emergency system is alive and well also in Guam. Uh, the civil defense and homeland security, which we, in Guam, we have a Guam Homeland Security Office. We have a uh, Homeland Security Advisor to the Governor. Uh, we have direct linkages to the Joint Region Mariana, which is the Air Force and the Navy. Uh, we have uh, coordination between all the public safety agencies, like police, fire, etc., uh, ambulance services. All of these systems are well honed and trained uh, professionals to be able to deal with it. Now, on the other side, in the infrastructure conversation, um, Guam is one of the most, um, for lack of a better word, pummeled island when it comes to storms, because we get a lot of storms, and everybody knows that. Uh, but we get these typhoons that come up, and they, they you know, go up to our Philippines or Japan, or and you guys, you get them worse than we get them, actually, because they're pretty strong by the time they get up here. <clears throat> But um, the, the island is built on steel reinforced concrete uh, infrastructure standards. <coughs> Excuse me. So 
When, when we in the tourist market um, come to Guam or you're going to the University of Guam or we have um, in uh, October, November, we're looking for a lot of students that are coming um, to Guam to do a student exchange program and the uh, educational opportunities like, you know, English language and, and cultural experience. Um, all of them live in well uh, established um, structures that are more than capable of withstanding uh, the storms that come through and uh, almost anything. And there's something also that's more the lexicon in, in today's uh, conversation on emergency, which is shelter in place. So if there's something outside, you shelter where you're at. <clears throat> you don't go and go outside and expose yourself to unnecessary harm. So that same kind of system exists as well. And if there were to be any kind of attack, um, and I don't believe there will be, um, and neither does most people, but um, the public safety agencies also work hand in hand with the Guam Visitor Bureau, the Guam Hotel and Restaurant Association, and the tourist uh, uh, stakeholders like the hotels, uh, transportation companies to make sure that they get to where they need to be, uh, whether it be the hotel or any kind of emergency services. So Guam is, we've, we've really honed our public safety apparatus uh, over the last seven years since I've been the overseer of public safety. So everybody's working together with all stakeholders. Yes, sir. Ma'am. <coughs> Hi, uh, my name is Kim Yuan. I'm with Pan Orient News. Um, I've got two questions. The first one is, um, I saw the statistics on the sheet you gave us. Why is there been a decrease of tourists from Japan every year by significant amount? Um, and the second question is that um, in the recent week in learning about North Korea, um, it seems like the Japanese media, just living in Japan, looking at, watching the media, um, likes to skew, and I agree with you. I think if I were to go to Guam today, I wouldn't be scared or anything about the missile attacks, and I don't think most people in Guam would be either, mm -hmm. but the media has been cherry picking um, people who are, um, and how, does, how do you feel about the media showing that side, those people who are actually afraid of Guam and uh, broadcasting that? Thank you. I love your, your question. Thank you. I will let uh, Nate answer the first part, okay? Uh, so I'm a politician. I'm an elected leader. If I say a hundred things, I make mistakes on two of them, those are the only two that get published. So the truth is the truth, right? We, we, we're humans. We all make mistakes. And so, you know, just uh, with respect to sensationalizing or, you know, honing in on that one. Um, people, it's a matter of perception. And that's one of the reasons we're here is to clear up the perception. Um, one. Kim Jong-un never actually threatened to shoot the island, period. Um, two, even if he did, we're protected. I have peace of mind. I hope all of you do, too. And, and finally, um, you know, when you know something in your gut, like you do, you said, you go to Guam, you know you're going to be fine. You will be. So will everybody else. All the students, all the parents, all the newlyweds, every person from any location. You come to Guam, you're perfectly fine. You're missing out if you don't. You're really out. Missing out a great opportunity. Guam is just, uh, there, there is no better place. Okay, you know, you live in Japan and I live in Guam, but in my opinion, there is no better place to vacation, period. Guam is just amazing. It's a different experience. So if you want the same stuff, you can always go anywhere. But in Guam, the experience is amazing. You definitely need to go. Um, to the issue of uh, reduction in, in tourism, um, there, we've been dealing with this and think there's a number of factors to this. Um, anybody wants to reverse that tide and, and increase? We We've been increasing, but I will tell you year over year, the total number of um, increase in tourism on whole has gone up. We're at 1.5, we're gonna be at 1.6 by the end of the year. You know, that's the incremental growth we're looking at. The markets are diversified, and so um, I'll let Nate answer more of the details. Yeah, I think the Lieutenant Governor hit the nail on the head. You know, at one time, Guam was pretty much almost like 90, 95% all Japanese visitors. So, you know, we've really been making an effort to have, in any business, you want to have a, a diverse customer base, right? You don't want to just rely on one customer base. That being said, you know, Japan has always been and remains Guam's number one market. We have so much uh, investment in our tourism infrastructure, whether that be hotels, transportation, travel agents, optional tours. So there's so much uh, Japanese tourism investment on Guam. And so we're very focused on Japan as our number one source market. Uh, the reasons for the decline, you know, it really started with the, with the yen. You know, Guam, when I started this job six years ago, when the LT came into office, we were uh, 75 yen to the dollar. You know, it's gone as high as 20, 125 
or plus to the to the dollar. Now we're like around 110, a little <coughs> bit better. So you know that makes that drives the cost up for Guam in general um, because of the yen, and also that really affects most of our airlift to Guam, our airlines to Guam is on U.S. carriers, be that United and Delta, and so that pressure because they report in U.S. dollars has really uh, hampered their ability to add flights and in, in fact Delta has decreased some of their flight service to Guam and so without the seats and the airlift obviously if you have less seats in the market uh, the arrival numbers have correspondingly dropped but that's why this year we're really making a big push on uh, or the, these last two years to push to get more uh, airlines coming out of Japan so you can see uh, we've had uh, growth in Korea uh, because we've had so many more airlines coming out of the Korean market. So we're looking at that same strategy for Guam. So we're working with our existing airline partners, whether that's you know United, Delta, we have T-Way and JAL flying to Guam. So to see how we can support them to add more uh, flight service and then reaching out to new carriers as well. So we were happy to announce just, a, I think just two weeks ago that uh, from Nagoya, we're gonna have new service from Hong Kong Express starting in October. So I think a real key is uh, those two factors. So you're kind of, we're kind of limited by the supply of, um, of air seats right now. And, but you know, I think uh, the other, the, you know, the last thing is, you know, Japan is kind of a very mature, stable travel market. Mm -hmm. And so Guam for a long time, yeah, we've, you know, uh, we focused on volume and try to get as many arrivals as we can and measuring our results from the arrivals. But we started making a shift to look at quality. You know, so uh, you know, as the Japan market uh, becomes more uh, mature, more experienced travelers, we really need to focus on, um, you know, not just the numbers, but ensuring that we deliver a quality experience to all our Japanese visitors. And so we're really also trying to diversify our uh, profile or, and our markets in Jap within Japan. So that means, you know, Guam is well known as a leisure destination, right? But we're also trying to bring more. Uh, business or mice travelers, group travelers, so that's companies, corporate incentive trips, also school groups, as the Lieutenant Governor mentioned. So Guam is only three and a half hours away, you know, great for uh, uh, a short uh, company uh, trip to Guam. Mm -hmm. uh, and then within the leisure market, you know, Japan is an aging population, so, you know, Guam has been really known, started as a honeymoon uh, wedding destination for Japanese couples, but, you know, and then morphed into that uh, family-friendly destination uh, because people wanted to go to the beach. But Guam is so much more than that and has so much more to offer. So for the senior market, three and a half hour flight uh, to Guam is quite convenient, you know, so and, and quite easy to get there. So perfect for the senior market. Uh, and, you know, so we continue to diversify within Japan and really, uh, you know, the ultimate goal is to improve our the quality of our product and make sure that, you know, every visitor we have has the best experience possible. And I think, you know, uh, once we can get additional airlift, I think you'll see this uh, negative trend reverse. So yeah, thank you for your question. Yeah, I want to add one thing is you know, three hours. Think about it. Three hours, you got to be on a beach in Guam. Yeah, I know it's hot here. It's hot in Guam. But you, when you get cold over here, it's really cold, right? I mean, coming to Guam is a great place. Plus, you know, the fact that we're, uh, uh, we're basically tax-free, everything you buy. If you go buy a Hermes bag or a Louis Vuitton or, you know, if you go buy a, a necklace or, or anything, you don't pay any sales tax on top of it. You don't pay any, you know, any kind of tax, luxury tax, nothing. So what you see is what you get. So if you pay a $200 for a Louis Vuitton tie, you're not paying 10% or more on top of that on taxes. So you keep that $20 to go buy, you know, some nice chow down the street or, you know, do something different. So, you know, the the bargain that Guam is is, is pretty amazing. You, it's just... I, I, one time I went to the States, you know, I, I, you know, I traveled the U.S. Uh, when the 48 uh, states and I went to this one city and I was going to buy a computer, you know, laptop computer. I love Apple. So I was going to buy this computer. It's like $2,000. I said, OK, well, uh, 2000 So I said, OK, well, write it up. They show me the receipt. You got tax here, tax, 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 tax. By the time you're done, <laughs> it was like 120 percent of the original price. And they, well, I don't live here. That computer is not going to stay here. Can I get my taxes back at the airport? They said no. So I said, never mind that. I'm not going to buy it. But, you know, when you start buying big ticket items, it really adds up. So it really makes a lot of sense if for economic reasons you're trying to save money, but you want to get a quality destination, Guam's the best pick. Okay, we've really come to the end of our program here. And as is our custom, I want to present our guest with a one-year membership, uh, honorary membership oh, wow. <laughs> in the Foreign Correspondents Club. For you, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah.
Yeah. We're members. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> our, our, actually, our GVB office is in the building across the street, so uh, I'll come in. I'll come. Be sure to come and use this. And Does it mean we get a discount on lunches or coffee or? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> well, on behalf of all the people of Guam, I want to thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kroll. I appreciate the uh, moderation and all the questions from everybody. I'll stick around for a while if you guys would like to ask any questions directly. But thank you. Tuzus Masi, please come to Guam <laughs> and have peace of mind. You're safe. Thank you. I, I didn't know that Guam had a reputation for snakes. <laughs> yeah, that is true.